I think it's time to start. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear teachers, and all others who decided to join us today for this uh, first TCA meeting in, in Serbia, in Belgrade. I'm really honored and pleased to greet you on behalf of the Foundation Tempus, acting as the national Erasmus Plus agency in Serbia, hopefully uh, to become national agency, fully fledged national agency very soon. And um, I need to say a few words about TCA because uh, we are organizing such an event for the first time in Serbia. And uh, with the help of our colleagues from, from the national agencies that are already very experienced in that, um, you probably all associate Erasmus Plus program with uh, projects, is it? So? So the projects, K1 projects, K2 projects, strategic partnerships, uh, your cooperation uh, for uh, organizing mobility. There is something more that is happening within the framework of Erasmus Plus program, which is uh, the possibility to organize transnational meetings, to go above the level of our workshops for project preparation at the national level. So we can do it together with the colleagues from other countries. And this particular event today is such an example. We are organizing here a contact seminar, which will help you think about project ideas and how to write and develop a project. But there is more in this event, which is to make you think wider, to think bigger, uh, not only how to fill in different for, form uh, fields, but to put uh, your projects into the context of general trends happening in education, more particularly in our case today, it's going to be vocational education and training. You would probably ask me why we have chosen this topic. It, it happens actually uh, that the vocational education and training is, let's say, on the top political agendas in many countries. Serbia is not an exception. There are many things going on the, in the reform of vocational education and trade. The pressure from the labor market is present here as all around the Europe, all world. How to educate, how to train labor workforce, and how to make them competent for the ever changing environment uh, in companies, uh, the labor market in general. So, vocational education has a bit of a priority, let's say, for us today uh, in on this event. Uh, and um, maybe if we took a look at the, at the program in general, uh, the same goes uh, for, for other fields. Um, the idea is uh, that uh, today uh, you start thinking about strategic planning. So the projects from strategic planning uh, point of view, how you actually make projects serve development of your institutions. It's not only that we are writing projects uh, wishing to, to fulfill uh, criteria that are written in the program guide. Yes, we need to take care of them. But on the other hand, we have to make them serve development of our institution, meeting the needs of, uh, of the country, of labor market, of companies. In a way, uh, we need to combine these two to have the benefit from both sides. One sad thing is that uh, TC events of this kind we won't be able to organize until 2019, which uh, makes me think that you should feel privileged today <laughs> because you are the chosen field and uh, we managed to organize this one event to start with, but there would be many others to follow in 2019. Time is flying, of course. Uh, TCA can also organize thematic seminars, can organize study visits, etc. We'll speak about this during 2018. We will prepare ourselves uh, well. Uh, we are new in the Erasmus Plus program. You probably know that Serbia joined uh, less than a year ago, that we have only one program uh, national call behind us, the one that we are now finalizing the selection results about. And... Um, Given the fact that uh, we are starting launching preparations for the new calls, I believe that whatever you manage to think up today together in cooperation uh, would be transferred into nice and good quality project applications. 
I wanted to say and to, to, to say special thanks to the colleagues from, uh, from three national agencies that are represented today. Uh, <laughs> Ingrid, I somehow looked at you first. So Ingrid uh, from uh, Swedish National Agency, then uh, Joanna sitting next to me from Romania National Agency, and Mika from uh, Finnish National Agency. I, I'm not sure whether he He's, he's coming tomorrow to join us for, to, uh, for the presentation and for the work tomorrow. But, uh, and of course, uh, they brought um, uh, with them, uh, they managed to organize the, the, the vet teachers or vet representatives of the vet sectors from their countries could uh, take part in this seminar as well. But apart from these three countries, we also had uh, a goodwill from colleagues uh, from the Croatian national agencies. So Croatian representatives are also here today. Uh, UK, Scotland, uh, Netherlands, Portugal, uh, and Poland. Together with us, all together, nine countries represented. I, I hope I didn't miss anyone. <laughs> no. So. Um, so this is how it works with transnational meetings. We have guests from other countries. We have local participants. Yeah, special thanks to them as well for uh, joining us today. For uh, all, they, they were all selected through quite a, quite a competitive procedure that my colleagues from the school department organized. They had to uh, prove themselves as, as good participants to be able to join the seminar with the colleagues from the European countries, other European countries. So I, I think we have a nice framework for work today. The premises that are cool enough <laughs> Wishing you a warm welcome doesn't work for, for June in, in Belgrade, but uh, we would do our best to, to make it a fresh new start with uh, TCA in Serbia and transnational cooperation in general. Should be enough for the introductory word, yeah? Thank you. Um, to start with today, um, we will remind you a little bit of, of what are these two types of projects that you can prepare with your colleagues. And uh, this very first introductory short presentation uh, uh, will be given by uh, my colleague Jelena Kajganovic, waiting here. She's a master of explaining uh, <laughs> opportunities in K1 and K2 projects. The experience of the call that we have behind us really made us uh, widen the horizons and see uh, some new things um, for the call 2018, so the next program call, we will have all types of K2 projects. It would be a, quite of a task for all of us to cover all of that. But K2 for VET, for example, is already something that we feel better now <laughs> since one call is <laughs> already behind us. Jelena, please. I'm not really sure how this works. Okay. You hear me well, right? Okay, so hello from my side as well. Um, my name is Jelena Kajganovic. Maybe you have seen my name through the emails that you have received, all of them. <laughs> and um, I just want to thank my group once again for uh, helping organize all of this and thank all of you for finding interest in joining us uh, for these two days and hopefully it will be useful for you. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard this presentation um, from me already, so bear with me for a bit. And um, for the colleagues from other national agencies, this is a, this is a, a story that they've been uh, not only hearing but living for the past uh, couple of years. But I'm sure there are uh, some of our participants primarily who are new to the, um, to the program, so we felt like we had to go through K1, K2 once again, just to get everyone familiar with this. Um, I'm sure that there are some of you who actually, I recognize some of you who applied and actually got in our projects. So can you tell me how many of you like haven't heard this presentation, just to see um, from our participants, from Serbian participants? Okay, that's good. Okay, so it will be new for you, I'm glad. Uh, so, uh, Thank you, Sofia, once again for, uh, for joining us today. And it's always difficult to go after her because my part is this um, a little bit more boring and technical. But um, I will try to keep it short. If you have any questions, please interrupt me at any point. Um, so to start from basics, although I'm sure a lot of you know already 
what we are here for. So Erasmus Plus is the European Union program which provides support in the following three areas. And uh, their education and training, youth and sport. We are here today for education and training. Um, but to clarify a little bit where Serbia stands, also for our foreign participants. So we have partner countries and program countries. Program countries are the, one, are the ones that everything is available for. So the entire program is available for, for them with no limitations. We'll see some of the limitations we have faced in the previous call. Uh, we are not yet sure, in fact, uh, what will be limited for Serbia in the next call, as we are still not a program country. So it's important to, to understand that uh, we can cooperate with the EU countries and these five, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, Turkey, and Macedonia, but that Serbia has certain limitation, although it's not just a partner country. So uh, this previous call was our introduction to, to the program, but we're still not a full, a full member. So just to say a little bit about the first call, our budget was uh, fairly modest, um, especially for our uh, foreign colleagues. They will, they will see how actually this, this, um, these numbers are not as impressive as in their countries probably. So for K1 for schools, vet, and adult education, and for K2 vet, we had let's say almost a million euros. Um, all of this was used up and we're very um, happy, not, not, to be, not to be too modest, but we're very happy with the quality of applications we have gotten. Um, and we could not unfortunately fund all of the good ones, but um, our, uh, we had to prove, let's say, that um, we can absorb this, um, these funds and I think we've, we've managed that, which makes me think that maybe in the next call it will be uh, even even more difficult task to choose the, the winners. So uh, when we say K1, these are mobility projects, especially in Serbia, and it sounds a little bit odd. So let's just start from uh, what a mobility project is, and to simplify it, it's a project that enables organizations to send and receives and receive students to traineeships and teacher to training or teaching assignments. Why did I put and receive in brackets? Because in the previous call, we could not receive participants. This made it, I believe, a little bit more difficult for our schools especially to find partners because it's a two-way cooperation. It's expected for all of them to learn something new, to find out something new, and it's a bit more difficult with, when a school cannot send their own teachers to Serbia. However, like I said, it's been going well. We're not sure in the next call what our position will be. So this is one of the, one of the first limitations I will mention today, but we will keep track and we'll see in the new national call if this will be available for us. Hopefully, yes. The role of these projects is to increase and improve cooperation between institutions in Europe and uh, through the exchange of good practices and knowledge. So this is the essence of not only these projects, not only K1, but of the entire Erasmus Plus um, project um, portfolio, let's say. Um, so if you look at your um, binders, you will find some of the goals of the K1. Uh, we can look at that later in the groups, but just to mention some of them, it's increasing learning outcomes, support the professional development, foreign language competence, raise awareness of other cultures. So as you can see, there are more specific ones and then broader ones. Whichever ones you decide to base your project on, it is perfectly fine as long as you explain it and explain your needs through your uh, European development um, uh, plan. Um, who can participate in VET? Uh, so the applicant, it's a pretty widely explained in the guide, which is sort of like a Bible for the Erasmus Plus uh, projects. So always look at the guide first and then ask us because we'll look at the guide first and then respond to you. Um, why did I put vocational schools in bold? Because we have decided, especially for this TCA, to actually uh, raise the capacitors of our schools. Uh, we find it to be a little bit easier for enterprises or NGOs to apply for these kinds of projects because they have the experience with different kinds of projects and they have the project logic within their organization. Uh, however, the actual vocational education and training are within vocational schools. And this is why we're uh, giving the priority to you in these two days. 
um, and introducing you to your foreign colleagues so that in the next call, especially for strategic partnerships, we have more schools. This year, it's been a bit challenging. So hopefully, uh, next year, we'll have, um, we'll have more, more schools. Um, as you know, probably participants are learners and teaching and non-teaching staff from these uh, organizations. Now, the role of organizations from Serbia. It's important to know that we can be only applicants. So in the previous call, we could only be an applicant. You would apply to us, Tempus Foundation, and you would receive a full grant that you would later um, share with your partners or um, by, by the need, depending if it's a course or if it's a school and depending on your uh, agreement. Um, and also we could be just a sending organization while the organizations from the program countries could only receive and be our partners. So this is the second limitation. Again, we'll see in the next call if this will be the case. Uh, we also have to mention intermediary organizations. They can be either from Serbia or from the program country. They help primarily schools to organize uh, these projects if they don't have enough capacity or enough contacts. But of course, a part of the grant goes to these uh, intermediary organizations and it doesn't, uh, not the entire grant stays in the school. As for the staff mobility, like we said, it's a teaching assignment primarily or a training in the company or job shadowing in schools. In our experience, we had the most applications with job shadowing. However, you can choose any of these three and they can last between two days and two months. As for the student's mobility, um, it's a traineeship, which has two, let's say, forms. It can be only in a company or in a company with periods of learning in a vet school. They last up to 12 months. Uh, what we found out in Brussels, actually, last week is that the commission is insisting on um, having longer term mobilities for the students. However, in this call, we encouraged our participants to have shorter term mobilities because of the limited funds we had for this year. And they obliged just to just to mention because it was yes we had fairly small projects for their capacities we think for now it's enough. As for the partner search, um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. Um, we have primarily eTweening. Uh, how many of you are on eTweening? Yeah, we have a lot. I expected a, a little bit more actually. So <laughs> for those of you who are not on eTweening. Um, do join. Uh, it's a fantastic platform that um, engages teachers in schools to cooperate through ICT and it's possibly the best way to, to find partners for these kind of projects. Uh, as for the School Education Gateway, um, they're primarily, primarily courses. However, in VET you cannot attend courses as such. So it's important to know that on this platform you can also uh, find, let's say, offers for, especially for strategic partnerships, uh, and you can maybe place your offer and find partners through this uh, platform. Uh, there's also Erasmus Plus uh, project results platform. We had a lot of questions on the ideas for these projects. This is the best place to go. And then if you find a topic that might be interesting to you, and you find all the partner organizations that have participated in the project, you can build up on their experience and maybe partner up with them. You can find their contacts there, it's very easy. What don't we have on this list? We don't have events like these. So it's, as we know, the easiest is to bond and to find um, common uh, interests face to face. So what we will try to do in these two days is to introduce you to each other and encourage you to find um, fields that you are um, most connected in and then uh, build up on that and possibly have successful projects. Deadline for applications is uh, noon, February the 2nd. Don't wait the last second. We did not have these problems this year. I expected more actually. Um, so we actually did not have not even one that was late or that had a problem with submitting. So. Um, it's all good. Hopefully, it stays like that next year. Um, projects sh should start between the 1st of June and 31st of um, December. Um, so these projects are pretty easy. Do we have any questions on them? Was this clear? I tried to be as short as I possibly can so we can maybe have time for discussion as well. Everything is clear. I suppose. Okay. You can introduce just a few words concerning the, the call behind us. You know, we, 
we had to face the fact that the number of applications coming from general education sector was higher than coming from the vocational education and training sector, that is to say, wet schools, what we expected to have in the K-1 project. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, the, the ratio is like nine projects selected in VET uh, as compared to 31 uh, in general education. So for us, uh, uh, we feel like there needs to be some, some urge, some more urge to, towards VET schools to think about uh, applying for K-1 mobility projects and to see how they can contribute to their work and uh, use it in the best way. So. Well, speaking openly, we are hoping for more projects in K-1 for that sector next year. I would just like to mention that the same problem you're experiencing is something we experience as well. In Romania, the largest amounts, largest grants are in the VAT sector. And still, like, you get 50% of them um, actually financed, while in the general education, you have 500 projects that are applied and only 50 get financing. So this is something that's on the European level, it is a problem, maybe not for countries where the VAT sector, the dual system is very well developed. And I would just like just to encourage you, um, if you try to follow the, um, let's say, the objectives of the program and uh, the communique from Bruges, which has a very, let's say, strong initiative toward VET, then there's no problem and VET projects are always welcome. And we welcome any partners, quality partners for any countries in the VET sector just to make it stronger. Thank you. Thank you so much on, for your input. And actually, just to maybe add up on that, we had a lot of VET schools applying for general education. Um, Maybe it was easier for them, I would assume, to just apply for the course abroad. Because then you don't have to find a partner, you apply for the course, you usually get accepted. It's just easier. However, we believe the benefits from engaging in the actual VET field can be larger if you, if you, decide, if you decide acting on that. So hopefully, yes, next year, I think we might even have more funds for for VET than for general education. So the competition will be higher, so that should push you to go towards VET and, um, and not be afraid of, of going for actual VET topics. Now, as for strategic partnerships, maybe you saw in your agenda that we, are, um, that we will have three overarching topics that we will deal with in the group work and only one K-1. Uh, there's a reason for that and the reason is that they're just a little bit more difficult and it's more difficult to find the partners, to find the topics, to define the goals. Um, it's our goal in these two days to encourage you to do just this. Uh, so in the, this first year, K-1 projects were quite enough. We were happy with the applications and how many we got. However, for strategic partnerships, we already had an issue. We didn't have a lot of funds, but we could fund, let's say, two or three projects. Um, very, very low number of schools. So um, we would encourage you to, to look to strategic partnerships um, as something that would, be, that would be an option. So strategic partnerships for, um, under this beautiful commission definition are a transnational project designed to develop and share inno innovative practices and promote cooperation, peer learning, and exchanges of experience. What does this mean? <laughs> it means that uh, you are actually focusing on innovation. You're focusing on something that you are already experienced in. So in K-1, you can say, we have never done this or that, and you go to the school and you see it for the first time. For strategic partnerships, it's expected of you to have a little bit of experience in the field and just build up on that. Exchange the good practice or work on something new with your, uh, with your colleagues. So you have two kinds. It's supporting innovation and supporting the exchange of good practices, but I would say they both focus on innovation. So when you come back with the new practice, with something new you saw from your colleagues, you're expected to implement it and for that to be an innovation for you. So the only difference would be a tangible uh, intellectual output, output the way commission calls it in the innovation uh, projects. Um, 
also in your uh, binders, you will find priorities. There is a lot of them, and why we have horizontal and field specific. Horizontal are there for all of the strategic partnerships. Now, they spread from higher education to youth, and it's important to have, let's say, overarching uh, priorities that connect all of those. Um, for the field specific ones, I also simplified them, but you will find the full version in your binder. Uh, why did we print it out for you? Because you will have to, uh, for your uh, ideas for the projects, you will have to choose at least one priority out of these. So you can have more, of course, but don't have, which is what we were saying in the previous call, don't have 10, because no project that lasts for two years can um, be based on 10 priorities and fulfill all of them. So be ambitious, but be modest at the same time if that doesn't confuse you too much. Um, <laughs> but so, so focus on something that you can actually achieve, because these projects are very oriented on the output, and what you promise is what you are probably are expected to deliver. So um, take something tangible and do it by the end of the project. Um, as for the field specific uh, priorities, work-based learning, it's the it word in Europe right now and actually in Serbia as well. Um, you have probably heard a lot in the media uh, lately about uh, dual education and it's a point of debate in Serbia. I don't know how it is in Romania, maybe you can tell us. <laughs> it's okay. It's the problem is with dual education is that if you don't have a system that's very well developed and very well built up, I, whenever you talk about dual education, I think most people think about Germany. Yes. I think uh, they do. And one of the reasons they do this is because in Germany, they have a history behind it. It's very difficult to build dual education out of thin air. There has to be, let's say, a sort of education when it comes to companies, to small and medium enterprises to get involved, when it comes to schools, and when it comes to individuals, because I think in most countries that do not have that instated within, in their, let's say, individuals, what happens is um, learners would usually go for more general education-oriented practices, and they don't see that as something that would make them stand out in society, which I believe is a, it's a damn shame, just because if you look at it, um, usually an electrician will always be, let's say, better suited to any community than a lawyer. There are more cases where you need an electrician than a lawyer, and we always say this to all our learners, and I used to say it when I used to teach. And the, the thing is, when you talk about dual education, it is difficult to take a system that it's oriented on theory to change it all of a sudden in something that it's ori oriented on work-based learning because that's what you're talking about. But just so you know, NAs have been involved in the process and they actually had a project, a widespread project, it's called Network-Based Learning. If you will look us up, it's Network-Based Learning, you will find us and we've actually built a platform helping organizations that wish to use dual education within um, K1, just to spread it wider, and to have organizations from countries where your education might not be that well known, or work-based learning might not be that well know, known, to uh, build on pilot projects and make them go further. So just look it up, and trust me when I say we're also just starting out with dual education. It's kind of funny, because in the communist period, you actually had dual education. And then we decided it's no good, <laughs> and now we're trying to rebuild it. Okay. So I think most countries that were in the, com in, let's say, went through that historical period uh, actually meet the same problems in this respect. Thank you. I love the political correctness of this. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Yeah. But um, the thing is, yes, that our system will look up to the German system in the implementation. So, of course, there will be a lot of um, challenges ahead, but we uh, subtly encouraged you through the topics that we imposed on you <laughs> to, to discuss in, in groups to, to focus on, on work-based learning. Um, so, um, it's an important topic and it's happening. So, there's, there's no avoiding it and our role is to actually find the best ways to, to accomplish it. And it's a huge field where you can cooperate with your colleagues who are either in the same situation, just starting, or the ones who are way ahead of you, 
So it would be a perfect, let's say, overarching topic for a strategic partnerships because there is so much to learn and there is so many new things that could be developed through this. Um, furthermore, we have key competences in VET, which is pretty self-explanatory uh, and it's a wide field as well, where you probably have more experience than, than us who have not worked in the VET field, to, to know what these uh, key competences are and what you can develop on with your, with your colleagues from abroad. Also, we have uh, enhancing access to training and qualifications, especially for the low-skilled, uh, which is also a topic that in Serbia could um, could have a lot of um, could have a lot of space to to develop. Um, we also have, um, of course, development of vet teachers with the focus on the use of ICT, which is challenging a bit maybe in vet. Uh, so it's a it's one of the one of the important priorities, and of course. Um, engaging teachers is in the core of all of these projects. So I simplified them a little bit for you, but you will find them in your binders and hopefully in the groups you will discuss how these priorities basically lead you to the goals that you are supposed to, that you're supposed to base your projects on. Um, now understanding strategic partnerships is a, bit, um, is a bit tricky maybe when we were explaining them before in the previous call, uh, people seemed a, a bit puzzled. How is it not just a more complicated K1 project? We had questions like that. <laughs> Did you have questions like that as well? Uh, well, just so you understand, we've been in the program a very long time and it's very similar to the previous program, to the lifelong learning program. But just so you know, for that, actually, it's very similar to the projects they had before. So you have here organization, and there's one organization from Romania that could tell you more about that. And I think from Sweden as well, there used to be those projects called transfer of innovation. Mm -hmm. So that's what it actually still is, even if it's not called that. And But we do, we do have those questions all the time when it comes, how do you build it? Uh, how is it not the more complicated mobility K1? Well, this is for each organization to decide what they wish to, you know, what you wish your end result to be. Because if you look at objectives that you sent out in K1 mobilities, they're far less, um, let's say, imposing or um, innovative than they are in strategic partnerships. You can do so much more when it comes to you know, develop a, developing things that are actually visible, like you have results that you can use later on, because K1 focuses on building competence, while K2 focuses on building visible results that you can then transfer and adapt to others. So, yeah. Um, what we had some comments on is that, but they're both organizational projects. In K1 as well, you have to explain how your organization will benefit, not only the people who are going to the mobility, but the organization itself. Yes, they are. However, here, again, we're saying you have something tangible, something measurable that you can show. Of course, building up competences in K1 is important for the organization itself, but this actually requires, because it's a more complicated project, it requires the whole organization to be uh, included, and in the end, you have something to show, to put it like that. Uh, so it takes minimum three organizations from three program countries, which really shows the, the seriousness of this. There's no upper limit, so you might be managing, let's say, seven different organizations from seven different countries. It's a huge thing. It also builds up your capacity for projects as such. And after you go, I believe, through one strategic partnership in Erasmus+, Plus, you can go through pretty much any kind of project that you, you can apply for. So after you manage this, you should be fine with almost anything. Um, that's why there is more focus on project management. In K1, you can have one or two people dealing with participants, and that's about it. You follow them, you see that everything goes well, you follow the financial part, and that's about it. Here you need more people. You need more organized uh, strategic approach to communication, to um, all of the products, to all of the partners, how you will demand stuff from them, how you will expect, how you will organize transnational meetings and things like that, how you will best use the time and the money that was given to you to develop this. 
So um, it also includes variety of activities. Like we said, it's not only mobility. Uh, there's blended mobility for learners. There's transnational meetings. There's so many things that would require you to meet up and to actually work on these things together. Like we said, it's irreplaceable to have somebody in front of you and talk to them actually about the thing you're working on. And not only through emails or through Skype. Of course, it's useful. Of course, you will use it but it's irreplaceable to actually sit down and talk about the issue that you're working on. Um, so funding the development of intellectual outputs would be the thing that it's um, in the innovative part. So you need an intellectual output if you are focusing on that sort of projects. So it can be, let's say, a brochure or a new course or um, a new methodology something that you will later on apply in your school. You also have that in your, in your uh, binders, some sort of examples that, uh, that, you can, um, that you can see. And I would also, uh, again, mention the project platform just to see the examples of what people have been uh, developing through these projects. Of course, a website is almost a must for these projects. So all of this um, takes you to, to a conclusion that it takes a lot more, but it gives a lot more as well. Um, larger budget, larger responsibilities and expectations from you. Um, dissemination is extremely important, and it, let's say, it matches your promises in the project. So it's very important once you have the intellectual output uh, for it to reach as many people as it can especially if it's a policy thing, possibly. So you can also influence the policy through these projects. It's highly recommendable to focus on something like that, for example. Um, again, you need clearly defined goals, outputs, and dissemination uh, strategies. We mentioned all of this. And the duration for Serbia in the last call was between a year and two years. For the, EU, for the program countries, it's longer. So it's between two years and three years. We'll see in the next year how it will be for us. Uh, however, we believe that um, in this period, you can also hope to develop, to develop um, very, very good things. The deadline is a bit longer. So it's the 29th of March at noon. And um, this will be it for strategic partnerships. I didn't want to get it. Oh, please go ahead. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yes, I, I'm Norbert from the Netherlands. Ah, welcome. Uh, you explained that uh, in Serbia, uh, okay, can, can we ask you to take the microphone because, uh, yeah. Okay. I will not give it back. Uh, um, my question is, um, uh, you explained KA2 for, from the Serbian uh, uh, as a partner uh, country. What uh, a KA2 from a program country? So can we take Serbia as a partner in a KA2 project? So it is possible. However, again, limitations, a little bit of limitations. You have to explain what they call the added value of that organization. So because we are not a program country, yes, you can, in theory, take an organization from Serbia for KA2. However, it would be a bit more complicated because you would have to prove that that organization brings something to your project that no other organization in the EU can bring. So in theory, it's possible. In practice, good luck. You know, it's... <laughs> what about the next year? The next... Until we become a program country, it will be like that. So it's not one of the things that's debatable, like the length or if I'm not mistaken. Well, that, that's definitely the, the case for the next call. Uh, speaking about the calls 2018, we'll see about 2019. We'll see, yeah. Because uh, there is one more call that we are absolutely sure the situation will be like this or similar. But then for the call be after that one, the, ch the things can change. The thing is that today, uh, since we are here in Serbia and um, we had to present you the, the situation from the perspective of, uh, from our country and possibilities of cooperation with Serbian institutions. During these two days, you will have the opportunity to hear experience of other countries, of course, and uh, share it with, with us. But we have to bear in mind uh, these, these limitations that Jelena presented that were a consequence of uh, the current phase that we are going through. Soon it's going to change, and <laughs> hopefully we will no longer speak about exception that an exception is. Yeah. 
I would just like to add that, well, we have projects in K2 with other pan partner countries, um, because we're already on our third year, I think, of this sort of projects. And trust me when I say that finding an organization with added value might be difficult, but it pays off. And if you have any intentions of doing this, make certain to discuss it with the representatives of your national agency before you do. They might have more insight than, well, anyone here does because of that, because they've been through it. And there are, there are great projects with partner countries. Trust me when I say you might find an organization that gives you something that you've been looking for a very long time and you haven't found it anywhere else. And since you are in a contact seminar where you're supposed to get in contact, like, face-to-face, -face personal, you might discover things about that organization that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So just don't give up, give up on it. I mean, it is more difficult in practice, but why not? I mean, what do you have to lose in the end? Just try to figure it out. Well, uh, some people did risk, and uh, I think other countries, it, obviously the risk is uh, at the other side, not Serbian side. <laughs> but we had, uh, I, I would say, uh, we had some kind of statistic and overview that uh, the Commission sent to us uh, some time ago. Uh, it reflects the situation with previous calls, but there were around 20 projects approved, funded, uh, in different sectors. It's not, all, not all of these were in vet sector, but they were in, in adult education, in vet sector, which involved Serbian partners uh, as uh, partners bringing this added value. Uh, the one that I remember, for example, was uh, I think the Spanish National Agency approved the project, and imagine the, the Chamber of Commerce from Serbia was involved because of uh, some good practice example that they have. The, the budget for partners from partner countries, or for example, for Serbia in, in this case, which is neither partner nor program, somewhere in between, was quite modest. But that still is an opportunity for cooperation, a couple of thousand euros to fund a mo few mobilities or to organize a meeting in, in, in that uh, partner country institution is already something that makes a difference for us. <laughs> Hopefully for you as well. Hopefully. And then, of course, if you have a good idea, then you can always apply to us and then have us be the <laughs> leading the project and then be a partner. But it's, it's all up to you, and hopefully you will find in the next two days um, partners worth uh, working with. So this would be it. I don't want to get into your <laughs> into your term. And um, thank you so much for your attention. I hope this was useful. And uh, let's go on to to Joanna and Marinella. Thank you, Elena. Yeah, indeed, you reminded us of all the things that we have to bear in mind, uh, <laughs> given the the current status of Serbian uh, participation in Erasmus Plus. So now we are switching to to experienced countries. <laughs> um, Joanna will uh, speak about that mobility charter. Yeah. Because um, I usually walk around, so I like to get you involved. An inspirational speaker. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello. It's done. It's on. Okay. Um, well, it's ni nice to meet all of you. My name is Joanna Stichamera. I'm an mobile a mobility expert, let's call it like this. I'm also involved in all the IT tools we're using and I've been aiding my all my colleagues in the VET Charter movement. Has anyone had, had an opportunity or has read about the VET Charter till now? Does anyone know what the VET Charter is? Yes, I have, yes, great. Okay, so I'll be talking to you about the ins and outs of the VET Charter, so basically what it is, how to approach it um, and for the newcomers to the program why you should have your eyes set on it because just let me say in your case it's a long-term thing like you need to get ready for it starting now so what are we discussing we're discussing what a vet charter is we're discussing who is eligible for a vet charter how to apply or why to apply for a VET Charter, 
yeah? And what are the mandatory documents? And what is the European internationalization strategy? You've been reading a lot, I think, in your program for this next couple of days about internationalization. So we'll be focusing on that. Then a couple of helpful links, just to make certain, like when you look at everything in like half a year, half a year, make certain you know where to look for things. And well, we'll also have a questions and answers, but if you want to ask me questions through the presentation, please be, feel free to do it, I won't mind. So what is the VET Charter? Well, the VET Charter is an accreditation. Does anyone know what an accreditation is? Ever were <laughs> I have a very, very well-informed gentleman at the back. Well, an accreditation is basically what we would like to call it the national NA, the national agencies. It's trust. We trust you. We offer you trust. And in the case of the VET Charter, is a trust for the next five calls, once you receive it, that allows applicants to submit simplified applications. Have you submitted VET applications this year? Everyone? Last year. So everyone has submitted at one point or another an application? Is it a lengthy application? Is it difficult to fill in? Yes. It would be great to, be, to, you know, to just make certain you already have the money in advance. So basically that's what the ch VET Charter does. First of all, you can submit a simplified application. That simplified application, um, once you get the charter, would mean basically saying how many people you want to send in a mobility and who you want to have as a partner. It's very, very simple. And you wouldn't have to go through a qualitative assessment. We all, read, we all know how difficult it is on the nerves to go through a qualitative assessment and wait for months to know if you get the grant or not, isn't it? Like, wait for that list to be put up by each NA. So that wouldn't happen anymore. But what does the Charter do? I mean, why would the European Commission go through this? Well. Have you heard about the Erasmus Charter? Have you heard about, um, let's say, universities? Do you know that universities, when they submit an application, they just submit a simplified application where they say, we have this many students and we want to send them abroad and that many staff. And that's everything. And when they're reviewed, they're reviewed on past performance and they just get the money, basically. So what the Charter does, is basically change the game a little bit for VET organizations. It encourages um, organizations with a relevant track record on mobilities to further develop their European internationalization strategies. Now, a relevant track record is not sim something that just pops up out of thin air. It basically means we look at your previous projects and you should have a couple of them already, you know, finalized. And we will decide whether or not you are worth our trust. Yes? Uh, is this also, do you look at uh, previous projects that you had in lifelong learning? Yes, yes. I'll get right on to that as well. Yeah. We, we look at at least three of your previous projects. But those are the, but we look at the projects that you decide to to tell us about. We wouldn't start like looking like if you had 20 projects, we wouldn't go through all your 20 projects. But if you have three projects, we will basically, it's like, it's like when you, when you send a CV in, you know, any CV, any curriculum vitae, when you send it in, you have to make certain that it's appropriate for the job you wish to have later on. So we, basically we would um, analyze or assess how well you've chosen the projects out of all those you already had. Then it says it aids VET organization to develop their European internationalization strategies. Now, the thing is, the program believes each organization should have an organizational operational strategy, which is something normal. And most VET organizations in most um, program countries 
are actually requested to have such a strategy set up if they're in the public sector by their ministries but if they're in the private sector you need to have a strategy to know what you will be doing later on so you need to make certain you have that then why why do we build up the VAT charter? Why do we need it? It's actually to increase the quality of mobilities. What it does, it is, when you look at past mobilities, when you look at what an organization has already done, it is far easier for us, the NAs, to give you our trust. We know you have good, good projects and you've had them for a while, so instead of making you squirm every, every call, and go through um, the entire process, we say, well, you have good projects, we know they will be good, we will still monitor you, like, don't worry, we will be on your case when it's needed, but we will support you. We will support you to make certain that the mobilities you have and that the impulse you've had in this direction keeps up. Okay, so who is eligible for a VET charter? Now, this is the difficult part, especially for Serbian organizations. Um, first of all, it has to be a VET organization. This is pretty easy. Or it has to be a national mobility consortium. A national mobility consortium or consortia. Do you know what a consortium is? The same gentleman at the back? <laughs> well, a consortium is, let's say, a partner group built up of at least three organizations, all from the same country, that all, uh, all follow the eligibility criteria. So, what are the eligibility criteria? You must be a vet organization established in a program country, sending its own learners and staff abroad. This is what it says. But by the time the uh, Serbian organizations will be eligible to submit applications for the VET charter, guess what? You will already be eligible. So this is what we hope, because um, for VET organizations to be eligible for the VET charter, you have to have three projects finalized. So if you are considering the minimum duration of a project, which is 12 months, that would mean that you would be eligible for it um, let's say 2020, 2021. And just so you know, the program as it is right now will go on, will follow um, with another program. And we had something similar to the VET charter in the lifelong learning program. It was, um, it was like an award that you'd get and you would be able to apply in a simplified manner as well. And we had that sort of charter follow in into the Erasmus Plus program. So this is what will happen, and it's not most likely, it's like 99%, unless they decide at last minute to change something. This is what will happen to, um, to the Erasmus Plus VET charter. Once awarded, you will be able to carry it on through for the next five calls, which will most likely overlap with the new program or sometimes might be just in the new program. Then the applicant must have at least three completed projects at the moment of application and consortia, and this is very important, consortia should exist prior to the application, formally or informally. And actually the next presentation will come from um, a consortium that was awarded a VET charter. Now what does it mean to exist prior to an application? It basically means that I have three organizations who either together have had at least three projects, right? They've had three projects together, or they've each of them had three projects by themselves. Now, it says formally because when I talk about consortia, thinking of Erasmus+, Plus, from our point of view, that's a consortium. You, had had, you have had three projects projects, you've worked together. Informally, it means um, although you're just now thinking of yourself as a consortium, you've actually worked together at a regional or national level before. Okay, then, 
why apply for a VET charter? And I would like to get your ideas here. And let's see if they overlap to what an NA thinks. Would you apply for a VET charter? No one. Oh, wow. I, I, feel, I feel like I'm, like I'm supposed you have it very well. Why did you apply for it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We applied for it because it's uh, it was good for our strategy. Okay. And uh, and uh, it uh, it, um, it it puts a priority on internationalization for the whole organization. Yeah. So that's why we did it. It's been very good. And how do you see it? How w how does you see it? Like in basic things at an organizational level, what are the benefits that you've reaped up until now? Well, it's the organization that officially says we want to become more international mm -hmm. from top to bottom. Exactly. And uh, and and not only do you say that uh, in a meeting, you uh, say it on an official document, and you know that after one year, um, the agency will come and ask, "What did you do? So, what yeah. did you do in in fact to to move forward?" And for me, that's been really really helpful. <laughs> I can always say, "Oh, wait a minute, you signed for this?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So, uh, yeah. And of course, the application is much easier as well. It yeah. also helps. Yes. Well, let's see where we overlap. First of all, you not only have a simplified um, application, you have an assured grant. Like from all the grant we have right now, I think Romania has about 11 million just for VAT mobilities. And out of, the, of those 11 million, we first have to set aside money for the VET charter holders, and only then do we consider all the other applications. So first of all, you have an assured grant. Now, when it comes to the assured grant, just so you know, when you apply for the first time, you have to say for the next five calls how many mobilities you will have. We can only set aside the amount you've thought of when you first applied for the charter. So basically, you get the charter, yay, I have the charter. After you have the charter, you have the deadline for VET K1, and when you ask for mobilities, you have to look in your application for the charter, and you have there exactly the, the number of mobilities, the maximum number of mobilities you are allowed. So this is what we're looking at. So you have an assured grant. Then. You no longer go to assessment. No one's going to verify the quality of your application because we already know what you want to do. Because you have an internationalization strategy that focuses on this and because we've already basically... It's like saying we've already qualitatively assessed your application for the, next, for the next five calls at that moment when you applied for the charter. But, however, you still have to go through this financial evaluation just to make certain that you will not ask for a grant or we don't give you a grant that's higher than what you have already set out to do in your charter. Then, you have the possibility to implement a short to medium term international internationalization strategy. Just so you know, when we think about internationalization strategies, we think of organizations that are either build it on an annual basis or from, let's say, three to five year basis. So when you do this, it helps you. Like most of the things you want to do with your internationalization strategy will one way or another focus on mobility. So why not help you in that regard? And then, reputation. Um, I don't know if this happens in any other countries, but in Romania, just having an organization or having an organization where, or a vet school where possible learners, possible applicants to that school already know that there is such a charter underway and that each year there will be a number of mobilities on a certain field where they can get this international environment experience, just knowing that helps the schools a lot. And we already see it. We see it like 
For the first year, when the charter was in existence, we only had three organizations submit applications, and all three received the, the charter. And now they're basically, they've submitted their second application with the charter, and they've told us, for this particular section, once we put it on our website and we said, we have mobilities, we have 80 mobilities per year in that sector, we've received more applications from learners. So this is very, very helpful. And also, just so when you think about reputation, the um, VET Charter has an international, an international website where you can see, where you can follow all charter holders and what they want to do. So just considering that, it's very, very easy to get in contact with such an applicant and, you know, ask them, how did you manage it? Okay, and then how to apply and want what to expect. So now we're talking about some of the technical aspects. So how do you apply? First of all, you have to look through the call and make certain your organization is eligible. Although the calls are pretty similar, there aren't that many things to change, like these are the lines we've set out, and I don't think the commission would basically change the rules of the game while the game is still being played. You still have to check if your organization is eligible. Then, fill in the appropriate PDF or web form. Just so you know, all applications will be moving from a PDF-based form to a web form, which means all of you will have to have, um, what's it called now, a European Gateway or um, European Authentication Service user in order to submit an application. But what it does, it will make it far easier for your organization to see all the applications you're submitting and that you have submitted. It will make it easier to implement a strategy because you will know in your organizations which projects are underway, which projects have been submitted, and what we can improve. And then you have to attach the relevant documentation. So what is mandatory for that charter is the declaration of honor, which I think most of you have already seen this year if you've submitted an application. So it's a PDF form, you have to print it, sign it, stamp it, scan it, and then upload it. And then you have the European internationalization strategy. Now, what it is exactly and how to build it, we'll talk a little bit later on. And you'll also talk about it tomorrow with Mika Sarnan from the Finnish National Agency. And trust me when I say he's one of the most competent people in this area. So you will have the possibility to ask loads and loads of questions and have them answer in more ways than you can count. And then you have to make certain that your application is submitted, filled in completely by the deadline. If you will be using web forms, this might, this might actually happen, um, this might actually happen, let's say, by default, but if not, just make certain you submit it by the deadline. Okay, now, in order to have an application receive a charter, right, you have to have, like, you still have criterias. Don't imagine you still ha you don't have criterias. You do, and um, you can look closer to them once you want to apply. Like, the call is built in such a way that you have the possibility to do that. You have very clear um, indications and clear examples of how to basically answer all the questions in the format, in the form. And then you have to have 50% of the score per each criteria, but at the end you have to have a minimum of 70 points, right, to get the charter. And this is not easy. Trust us when we say it's not easy. Last year we had 23 applicants and we only awarded seven charters. Um, this year we have six applicants and we still don't know, but we hope we will at least have three charters awarded because it's difficult, like building an internationalization strategy, a European internationalization strategy, as I said, this does not come up out of thin air. 
you need to build it. It's not something you start doing two weeks before your application. It's not something you start doing two months before your application. You should get in touch with people that are relevant within your organization that have already built a strategy for the institution to help you build this strategy. Okay, and then when we talk about the mandatory documents, we have first the Declaration of Honor. As I said, this comes with a PDF or with a web form. Um, filled, signed in, scanned, attached to the application. And then we talk about the internationalization strategy, the European internationalization strategy. There is no template for the strategy. Never has, never will be. The commission and the program itself is built in a very flexible manner. However, there are a couple of guidelines. Like, first and foremost, do you, know how to, do you know how you build a strategy? Do you know where you start from? You start from your environment. Because an internationalization strategy should be inserted, should already exist within your organizational strategy. So you should start with your environment. You should start with your regional, national settings, depending on the scope of your organization. You should see exactly what you wish to do. What are your needs? What do you want to do further on? So basically, you should then have a look at your goals, your values as an organization, your skills, what can you bring to the table, right? And also have a look at how you wish to basically make everything come into fruition. So you should have an action plan, right? And what the European internationalization strategy does, it builds up on that existing strategy. Now, if, it, if you already have it, then, well, within this strategy that you attach to your charter, you will have all the approaches and aims of your organization toward transnational mobility. Then, you have strategic vision and goals when it comes to this, to the mobilities. Then you will have the action plan that I was already talking about. It, what we like to call it, I don't know if you have this in your languages, is you need to have a red thread from when you begin to build your strategy, your organizational strategy, until you have the action plan and you have the actual ways to do things. Then when you have the action plan, is saying, how will you do this? How will you measure doing it? How will you make certain that you do it properly? And just so you make certain that you don't miss anything along the way, for those five calls, the NAs will monitor you. Now, monitoring an organization from an NA's point of view does not mean we will nitpick and assess you and do things like that. No, we will be there to guide you and to make certain that you don't stray from the road you've already set out in front of you. This is our purpose. And if you do not have the document that does this, right, you will have to build it. You will have to build it starting from the ground up. So this is a root grass movement. So you'll have to make certain that you need to produce the document effectively. If you have questions regarding it, do not hesitate at any moment to either get in touch with the people in your organization that are in charge of building the larger strategy or with the NAs. Now, there are a couple of helpful links. Um, whenever you need to know how to follow up the charter, the calls come out somewhere in November. So just you know, look them up. If you look on the EC, eceurope.eu, on the program, on the program Erasmus Plus, you will also find the call for 2016, which you can follow up. Um, I don't know how it works with the presentation, but I think you'll probably get it. <laughs> and then you have the mobility charters across Europe, and this is something I want to show you, just so you can see how Europe looks right now from a charter point of view. Let's, whoa, okay. 
I don't have internet? Okay. I don't know. Maybe not on this one, but I can show you later on. <laughs> and then, do you have questions? Any questions whatsoever? Um, if you want to know how your K1 mobilities fit in within the charter, if you have any questions regarding, you know, how do I make certain that the projects I carry out from now on are relevant for the charter, please. I'm all yours. Yes. Do we already have, or will we have, or could we have um, access to this PowerPoint? It will be. Uh, we as the organizers are giving solemn promise that the presentations will be available on our website as soon as we manage to get to our office and do it. So all of this would be available to you. Thank you. It probably comes, your question, as a consequence of this very clear and diligent way of presenting and explaining everything, really something that we can be only envious of. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna, so much for, for uh, well, it's making this uh, closer to, to the participants. Uh, I, I believe that many of you, the, you who can actually apply, <laughs> unfortunately, Serbian participants cannot apply for Red Charter, but you who can will will think uh, about this for sure. And as for Serbian participants, I would say that uh, we are always got, we are used to uh, starting with the preparations on time. So given the fact that your entry ticket toward charter is to have good uh, projects implemented, think of this now and uh, think of for joining. Uh, I would say that this uh, mobility consortia would be probably the best way for us to make it faster to, to be eligible because otherwise we would need to wait for three round, three rounds, three calls to get three <laughs> projects as a minimum to apply. Uh, hello, uh, just a little uh, after this excellent and very thorough uh, information uh, and you always have to refresh your minds. But being a very new organization or very new school, um, applying for a charter directly could make some, well, questions in your heads. But uh, I can assure you that those, uh, the schools, for instance, this is a very difficult name, Elof Lindelöfs Gymnasium in Sweden has got this. And I have contacts to these schools and they're uh, the project owners. So you can tell me if you want to mail them to ask about what the charter is like and how they managed. Because the best way is, as you say, to contact and talk, because this seems maybe a bit, oh, wow, how to make this, the first step, the second step. But this is a very good thing. And then to put in the, well, now I'm going to say ECVET and ECAVET, all these uh, documents and Europass, you have all the possibilities to have your uh, the recognition of this, that's very important to know. So please ask us, we, we have this ongoing in Sweden for many years and uh, they can answer you all the questions. I, I would just like to add for Serbian organizations, um, well you know that for VAT charter, for VAT projects for K1, you can apply as a single applicant, you can apply once for, per round, but I agree, if you would have consortia and you would be in different consortia during a round, then you would have more chances. But the reason I thought it would be very important for Serbian organizations is that definitely if you apply for VET projects now, right, when you will be part and you will be a program country, at that point, all that previous experience will be still an experience, an experience in Erasmus Plus, and you will be eligible. This has happened for other countries as well, for other former partner countries. So look into that and make certain you are, well, if you think about it, it's basically like a strategy. My strategy is that in three or four years, I will apply for a VET charter. In order to make certain that I apply for a VET charter at that point, I must have three projects that have been finalized, that have been completed, where I have used at least 80% of the grant. Just so you know, this is one thing that maybe I forgot to say. And at that point, you will, it will be much easier for you to go on and to find the needs that you wish to cover with K1 projects. 
So it is, let's say, a medium term uh, goal, but you should definitely make certain you reach to it. And then for organizations that, have, that are already part of a program country, try to find out how many VET projects you've already had in your organization. You might be surprised because we've had organizations that have said we're not eligible for a VET charter and then we would look through the projects they had already submitted and finalized and we were like, yes you are, because you already had, have six projects. This is why it's important to have an overview of an organization's project at all times. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joanna, very much for, for the additional clarification. So, um, so nothing comes overnight, but uh, taking care about every step with the project to implement will definitely help. Okay, Are there more me. questions or we can move ahead with the, with the next presenter? No, it doesn't matter. You can have, if you have two VET projects, like in one in your consortia and then you're a single applicant within a year, that's already acceptable. You have to have at least three projects finalized, which means you've been assessed, like your final report has been assessed and you have the answer to that and you have the final grant altogether. Yeah. Thank you. Again, no more questions. So our next presenter, would be uh, Mrs. Marinella Kiss or Kish? I'm sorry, I <laughs> Kish. Um, as you already said, she would be representing Gamma Mobility Consortium from uh, Timisoara Technical College. Yuan Minchu or Minku, sorry, is the institution she works with, and uh, she is also the coordinator of EU project. So please, Mrs. Kish, go ahead. The floor is yours. So hello, everybody. My name is Marina Lakish. I am the coordinator of European project, uh, of the projects of the vocational high school, Collegio Technico Ion Mincu from Timisoara. I am here to share, oh. I am here to, to share with you our perception as beneficiaries of the Erasmus VET Mobility Charter. Our national agency awarded our school uh, as coordinator of a national VET consortium uh, the charter for the period 2016-2021. Um, who we are? We are a vocational uh, school, as uh, I already mentioned, that prepares students um, in the fields of telecommunication, computer science, architecture and design, construction and public works, works uh, wood uh, products uh, manufacturing. Our, uh, all of these are uh, niche uh, sectors showing uh, real uh, development potential. The training programs which uh, we are provided for our students prepare them on four, edu uh, four uh, educational levels, similar to those uh, of the European Qualification Framework from level two to level five included. We have, been encouraging, uh, have been encouraging the international mobilities of our students and staff, international project cooperation with other countries. Internationalization is a part of our strategic planning for our school for 2015-2020. As uh, you can see the slide, uh, we have been truly committed. Oh, sorry. Where we are? We are uh, in Timisoara. Timisoara is a university city and an industrial uh, center in the western Romania. It is the fourth uh, largest city of Romania uh, and hosts around 400,000 people, those having the charm of a small city and uh, the opportunities of a big city. Situated in the western uh, part of the country, Timisoara is the capital of Timiș County, which borders uh, Serbia and hung Hungary offering a multicultural combination of daily life. 
uh, what kind of mobility is we implemented. We implemented uh, in the framework of Erasmus K1 VET, key action one VET, three types of mobilities, uh, VET learners, friendships, at vocational institution abroad. Um, also, VET learners trainship in companies abroad, and each year uh, between 5 to 10 percent of our students get opportunity to avail of funded work placement. All uh, the mobilities have, it, have uh, been uh, carried out via curriculum, and uh, the learning outcomes acquired by the participants have been recognized by ECVET. The recognition is performed uh, in compliance with the uh, ECVET guide for geographical uh, mobility and uh, the national legislation based on uh, an internal procedure uh, applied for all qualification. Um, I want to specify that uh, what we really enjoy discovering on our students after they return from their trainship abroad is that uh, they realize the fact that the world is uh, much larger, larger than uh, their environment, that uh, things can be different and we have to permanently adjust. Uh, this adjustment required uh, flexibility and when they return home, our students make the proof of this ability they developed abroad. They are able to use it every time they need in order to manage things, situation, different uh, than the way they know and they have expected. Also, we organized the staff training abroad. The teacher that have taken part uh, to such projects abroad come back, change as well. They turn back with uh, new didactic approaches and new experience in their own field of training. Actually, the teachers represent uh, the engine of our partnership and uh, they are interested in introduc introducing innovation in the curricula, for instance, new technologies used abroad and so on. Um, I uh, already mentioned all the trainees mobilities uh, have been carried out via curriculum. I have chosen some examples with uh, some examples of topics uh, interchangeable with other countries. And uh, there uh, is more. Uh, reciprocity actually is functioning. We have developed projects uh, where Portuguese students come to Romania for a trainship covering units of their curriculum. I talk about Portuguese students of uh, a training center from Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, Sinel, a good partner of us. Uh, the students are uh, trained uh, in uh, electronics and telecommunication. The general objective targeted by implementing these transnational mobilities is consolidating the quality of education and vocational training. Or, in other words, we want to help our students and teachers to familiar, familiarize with the international world. All this is part of our portfolio which enabled us in 2016 to get Erasmus VET Mobility Charter. What is the VET Mobility Charter? It's hard to, to give a definition. I have attempted to formulate a few definitions. And uh, I can say that the success uh, was founded on dozens of hours hard working and commitment on optimal coordination of all our activities in a constructive team effort. You can see the team there. Uh, all the time having uh, all the support and guidance of our national agency. Why is important to apply? are some 
several reasons. First, uh, it simplified the application process. There is no longer uh, a quality assessment. A separate uh, budget will be reserved for the charter holders. Uh, filling in the application form submitted uh, in February 2017, was uh, much simplified. Uh, we must, uh, we needed to present, to provide a project summary and the description of the partners. Um, another reason, our students and staff are eligible for more Erasmus grants. Uh, knowing that uh, we have uh, the money for uh, the next five years, that we have the mobilities and their times, we can better answer to the institutional and students' need and with the help of our partners. Here I try to present uh, some of our partners. Uh, we have concluded the partnership with uh, training centers, schools, companies which support us in implementing the mobilities. Having uh, been awarded with Vet Mobility Charter, it's an important asset uh, in the mutual trust. Our partner feels se uh, secure in the knowledge that cooperation is planned in the next academic years for the full uh, phase of Erasmus+. Plus. The fact that the school uh, is uh, listed on uh, Erasmus Plus website as holder of the charter open new perspectives for sustainable partnership. We are more visible. We are uh, among the providers of trainees with high quality standards. Are also another reasons. Uh, but I want uh, now to, to speak about the application process. Uh, there are few, as Joanna said, there are few compulsory steps in the application process takes uh, the existence of uh, European internationalization strategy, solid partnership, written agreements if the school wants to apply in a consortium. And of course, skills the, of the team to fill the application. Um, I already said that uh, internationalization is a big part of uh, the future. Uh, internationali the internationalization has been started by Collegio Tecnico on Mingo 15 years ago, when a handful of uh, enthusiastic teachers able to see the opportunities helping students and teachers to get familiarized with the international world. In time, uh, our school elaborated a strategy and institution, an institutional plan for period 2015-2020 where uh, internationalization has a major part because we believe that uh, it represents a significant part of the future. Um, our strategic objectives related with internationalization are consistent with improving curricula for all training areas. We developed development of international mobilities for students, development of international relationship, diversification of extracurricular extra activities. Um, through uh, these objectives, we aim at update, updating the contents, elaborate the VET units, uh, provide language courses and practical training for our teachers, uh, develop uh, training, uh, training on intercultural topics, and very important, to recognize the learning outcomes acquired abroad. We are focused on a better training of our students for the future world of work. And uh, we are committed to have solid partnership with the existing partner uh, and conclude at least uh, five new partnership uh, by the end of Erasmus Plus program. Um, to take part uh, regarding the extracurricular activities, we want to take part uh, in uh, international VET events, uh, the European Vocational Skill uh, Weeks, Week, conferences and uh, others.
I said that the school uh, which apply must have strong partnership uh, which allow it to plan a certain number of mobilities for the years to come and also type of mobilities. The partnership should be defined uh, in terms of memorandum of understanding, which is the key to mutual trust, transparency of the learning outcomes, and qualification over the border. At the time of, uh, of uh, application, uh, Collegio Tecnico on Minco already had concluded uh, uh, memorandum of understanding uh, with different uh, vet institutions from Europe for the period 2014-2020. And uh, these documents uh, settle the general cooperation frame uh, in the view of organizing and implementing international trainships. Contain uh, details regarding the partners, uh, the targeted qualification in home and host country, uh, learning outcomes, uh, the correspondence between the different national education systems, uh, seeing concerning assessment, certification, validation, <coughs> how, what, and who performs the transfer and recognition of the learning outcomes. Since we applied uh, in a consortium, we concluded agreements with the other partners. In our case, Colegiul uh, Technic Decebal from the Robeta Turnu Severin and Liceul Bănățean Oțelul Roșu are two vet school from our region. We collaborated before with these schools. Uh, the agreements uh, comprises responsibilities, financial and administrative arrangements, uh, selection procedure, things regarding uh, mechanism used uh, for the preparation of participants and monitor the activities performed. We are proud uh, of this recognition of quality and uh, we are commitment to further develop our international strategy. We are open to cooperate with international partners to conclude agreements uh, which, uh, with companies, with schools, uh, to further develop and implement ECVETO. Do the multicultural environment of Timisoara and Banat region, where we came from, and uh, since the VET charter is not set in stone, we are forward uh, to developing sustainable uh, partnership with schools, training center in this part of Europe. Thank you. Sorry for my emotion. Thank you, Marinella, and thank you, Joanna. So, Romanian experience was the first uh, to inspire you uh, today uh, for Red Charter, but also for, for in general about mobility projects. Uh, what I found striking is actually the, the, the way consortium functions and the number of projects you have and the number of student mobilities you have. Uh, speaking with uh, Joanna a little bit, uh, I, I saw that it's 157 students, uh, vet students per year that you engage, but actually they are split between the three institutions and you decided to put accent on uh, vet students, not that much on teachers. It can be different in other consortium, in other projects. Uh, it depends on what you consider to be your needs and how you approach the regional cooperation in this respect. Uh, some questions for our Romanian colleagues? Some more questions? Yes. Can, can we ask you just to take the microphone, please? I don't know, um, I don't know if there's a mic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, she, saw, uh, she said that uh, um, you have some commitments, or some partners. Yeah. Where, uh, where do you find this? People? Okay, um, when it comes well, first and foremost, it depends. Are you talking about the documents per se, or do you need the partners? Partners. Okay. Where do you find the partners? I saw intercultural center and so 
Okay. Yeah. Um, many, many of them. Yeah. Well, most of the partners they have, those are long-term partners. Like I can tell you, I think their first project came in 2007 in LLP, but they had projects even before that, the college as a whole. Uh, what I would say is finding partners her, has always been a problem for the vet sectors. Unlike other sectors, we don't have a specific section where you can find them. We're also not allowed as NAs to give you like a black list of partners. Do not touch that partners. Um, there are some NAs that have white lists, like partners that they basically would recommend, but this is something we, we do Mm, we do very rarely. However, um, there have been um, intentions and there have been certain tryouts of um, partner or let's say of services that would aid you with the partner side. When I said about network-based learning earlier, this is one of those situations. Like if you go on the network-based learning site, you can find partners there which are interested not only in dual education, they're in dual education, they're also interested in um, developing projects with you, mobility projects, this would be one section. Then um, the Spanish National Agency, and I will forward you the link, have, have had a project which the European Commission supports, which aims at doing that, at gathering um, relevant organizations across the board of VAT, for an, a gateway for that. And then, I don't know if other NAs have that, but we have, um, we have a Yahoo group. I know it sounds funny, but we've had it for like six or eight years. And right now there are about 900 individuals on the group. And I think Ms. Kish can tell you even more about our group because you can find partners there. You can discuss with other organizations that have used a certain partner and then discuss that if that's one way to do it. But usually NAs would start out a group of this sort. We started out with like there were 20 people on the group. So it takes a while. And you can also find organizations just by discussing here with organization from other countries. They might not be the right fit for you, but they could help you with contacts from that specific, uh, specific organization. It's like you need someone's previous experience to build the trust. And it's like, it's like in all domains, if you have a recommendation, it's like better. <laughs> so that's one way to do it. Thank you. More questions at the back? Uh, can, you, can we ask you to give the mic on? Is it possible, although Serbia is not a partner country, is it possible for us, uh, for the VET schools in Serbia, to sign a mem memorandum of understanding? Yes. Just so you know, a memorandum of understanding and um, like the learning agreement set out, those were set out under ECVET. Um, just so you know, one of the things that the VET projects aim to do, although now it's not mandatory, but we hope it will be later on, and I think my colleague from Sweden can help me in this regard, like to answer your question. Um, one of the things from the Bologna, from the, no sorry, not from Bologna, from the, um, what's it called? Um, the, the Bruges Communique, also focused on ECVET. Like, you, you know what ECVET is? Have you heard about it till now? I think so, yeah. So it's about recognition, and it's to ensure recognition across the board, across the European Union and its partner countries for, um, for skills and competencies acquired in a different um, work environment than your own. So this is what it aims to do. And the Memorandum of Understanding and the Learning Agreement under the ECVAT seal, this is what they do, they're built a little bit different. Like what the Memorandum of Understanding actually is, it's a long-term commitment or a short-term, depending. Maybe you want to do it for just one year and see how it works. It's a commitment between two, organization, two organizations to carry out certain mobilities in a certain environment where they specify, it's like a mini contract specifying what each organization does and what are the quality commitments they, um, they will follow. 
they that they will instill within their organization for those particular projects. Now, the memorandum of understanding is not something mandatory. You might start out with an organization for the first time and you wouldn't want to commit. It's like in every relationship, you don't commit straight from the start. You know, signing, usually start signing um, a marriage certificate does not happen in two days. You need to have experience with that. This is what happens. I like, to, I like to call it, it's an institution, a memorandum of understanding. So this is what happens as well. But maybe after a year of working with that organization, you say, okay, I want to make certain that we maintain the same quality of mobility, of mobility later on. And then you download the memorandum of understanding. It's on the commission website, no problem whatsoever there. You fill it out with what you need to be filled out. It's pretty flexible. Like you get, when you get a memorandum of understanding, this is what the European Commission would like to have the memorandum of understanding to have in it. But maybe you need less, maybe you need more. But once you have it, it's signed. It's what you can, like I like to say, it's something you can hold a little bit um, over the head of that organization to make certain that you carry out the, the do you carry out what it's supposed to be carried out in a certain way. And if you break that commitment, then at that moment you basically say okay we will no longer have the commitment but once the commitment is gone it's the same like with any contract this is what happens if you break it okay. the reason why i'm asking you this is um, because we already uh, cooperate with one school in sweden one school in croatia and one in slovenia but we do not have uh, signed uh, the memorandum and that's the why i asked as I said, it's not, it's not mandatory now. Maybe you'll have it for the next project, and that will be great. That will be something that you've obtained from this project. It's something you've built on. Usually the advice we give to the universities when they make a consortium for a project is to, to have these so-called uh, uh, agreements that are below the level of the main agreement for the project because people within the organizations can change and the institutional commitment should stay and if new people those that were not there when the project started when new cooperation was initiated if these people are no longer there the institution should feel responsible for what uh, what obligations what commitment was done before uh, sometimes uh, people would say, well, it's not necessary and it's in a way ruining our good working relationships. Um, I think we should go above that opinion and, and think about us not only as individuals and not everything depends on us. We are representing institutions and we are trying to commit our institutions for a longer term cooperation. And in this respect, it, uh, it makes sense to have some kind of a paper stating some basic things like, uh, I don't know, statement of, of goodwill to do something. Just, just one last thing, just so you can think of the memorandum of understanding like we DNA see it and how the commission sees it. It's, first of all, as you've said, as Sofia said, um, it's making certain that the organization sticks to something. And this is right because we say, you know how you say no man's an island? would say no man's a project. And the reason is very easy, because you can be in an organization tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, but you might not be there in a year. But your organization still is involved in a project. And we've had situations, I've just, I just, when I, before I came, I had a project where they don't have a memorandum of understanding, of understanding because they, we've been working with this organization for such a long time, we don't need it. And this was something that one of the assessors noticed when they actually assessed the project. And then what happened is that last week, they no longer had a receiving organization for their project. And they had the tickets bought, they had everything, and they had nothing to say, well, but you agreed to it. And this was because two people from the organizations that were in, from the organization that were involved with the project decided to leave. So this is what it is. It's actually padding for your own organization not to get hurt or not to get all of a sudden to discover, okay, so what do I do with the money I've already spent? Because certain, certain parts of the grant you can maybe 
um, say, well, it, it was a force majeure and I had, I didn't have what to do, what to do in this respect, but this is not one of it. You could have had like the, um, the security you would have needed if you would have had, for example, a memorandum of understanding, if it would have been an institutional agreement.